So more on that as well. Now, though, another big cat sighting this week that again fuels speculation that pumas are living in local bushland. Earlier this week, Winchelsea man Nicholas Pierce had the shock of his life when he says he was confronted by a large black cat in the Bamber State Forest near Winchelsea. Yesterday, big cat experts went back to the forest to look for evidence. Simon Townsend is a naturalist from Freshwater Creek and a former Melbourne zookeeper. Simon Townsend, good morning to you. Morning. You say you saw a cat once yourself. Tell us the, about that incident. Pretty straightforward incident. Um, a long time ago, I'm, I'm not 50, but uh, I was pretty keen when I was a young fella. We're going back to 73. Uh, there was a report of um, a so called black panther um, charging a group of fellows who were uh, engaged in cutting the scrub over the conduit, which is a major pipeline uh, behind Wolverton. A friend of mine was a relative of one of these cats, and um, he was a very, very well-respected um, bird ornithologist, and uh, who I've learned a lot from. And he said, let's go and have a look at what you do. We uh, went up to the area where the work team had claimed to have seen the cat, and um, we disturbed it at close range. It was lying up, looking out from a, a vantage point by the edge of some fairly a lot of thick forest, but looking out over the grassy area along the conduit, and um, I got a, a pretty good look at it at very close range. That it was close enough to throw a rock at. And this particular animal was retreating. It was it was doing what's known as a belly crawl. It was down as low as it could to try and get away. I estimate its size, uh, I suppose, in mass to be similar to my own as a 17 or 18 year old. And I was, you know, six foot tall and. You know, not exactly little, so it was, a, it was a bulky looking animal. It had muscles you could see moving under its skin and you could see the shoulder blades going up and down as it tried to get as low as it could to get away. And it looked back over its shoulder at us as we, we came closer um, and then did one great big bound from uh, maybe five metres or so straight into, straight into the, the forest and disappeared quite silently. It was something to be admired. It's a very serious, a very substantial animal. History goes that uh they were mascots from the US Army. When the war finished, they had to destroy these animals and they decided, well, they couldn't do that, so... The life expectancy of, a, say, a leopard in the wild, uh, males, probably about eight to 10 years, females, possibly 12 years. mature female, she should have in her lifespan about three or four litters. Um, within those litters you would expect to have you know, a couple of females. So by the time of her uh, lifespan she would have mature offspring that would be breeding as well so you know, you'd expect numbers to grow exponentially. And with urban sprawl moving out into these areas, there should be a whole lot more sightings. Yeah, it's just word of mouth, I guess, yeah. It's, well, even before I came to the zoo, I, I'd heard about these cats. Um, me, I personally don't believe them. Going right back to um, the late 19th century, uh, the, uh, unlike uh, what you'll hear around the traps, uh, I don't believe that this is a post-Second World War phenomenon. I think this goes back to colonial times. Um, my, I have a theory, I don't like spouting theories, but I believe we're dealing with a, uh, a colonial introduction of animals um, uh, during the heyday of acclimatisation. Remember, Melbourne Zoo and most zoos in Australia were founded as acclimatisation societies. They were designed to bring, uh, to care for animals that might be of some potential value from other countries in Australia and to get them used to living here. It doesn't necessarily mean they were things you'd you'd want to have around with you all the time. Um, trout, deer, these sorts of things are only here because of those acclimatisation societies. 
Uh, there's also the potential for uh, rich squatters' sons with an awful lot of money and not much else to do to entertain themselves, bringing out shipments of animals to uh, let go for hunting jaunts, just as the trout and the, the deer were as well. And um, there's no reason at all why there would be any shipping papers to show what came out. And if you, you wouldn't tell all of your neighbours if you were going to let a, a couple of panthers go to have a fantastic weekend with your mates. You just wouldn't say boo, and it, you didn't really care. Those sorts of chaps didn't really care about the, the little, the little uh, uh, sheep cocky over the next ridge. He wasn't. He didn't enter into their calculations at all. You know, there was another one back in the 30s where there was a circ, in the 30s or the 40s, a, a circus train. Uh, lost the carriage up near Nuji or somewhere and the cats supposed to got loose but they researched into that and there was no train smash at all. Urban myths. It's not that simple. Um, they're clever. Um, predators, if you're looking for a predator, uh, take it from me who's, who's hunted lots of cats and foxes, um, uh, once they, they have an idea that something bigger than them is looking for them, um, they become very difficult to, to, to track down. It's only when they're naive and silly and stare at spotlights or, or, or um, take one second too long to have a second look and they're, they're nailed. If you can imagine one animal that's probably only going to be, as I say, maybe seven feet long, you'd be lucky if it weighed 70 to 80 kilos at most, in 100 square kilometres of country and it's something that knows how to keep out of the way, your chances of finding it, except by sheer luck or serendipity, are almost nil. You just don't keep a tail. Um, and as we said, you know, he could have got a domestic cat and just stripped it from the neck to its tail and then, yeah, he would have had a, a skin of a cat. You can sort of understand he was a deer hunter that collects trophies. When he's, he shot this animal, he said it was just a large cat, it's got no head, so automatically he's gone, oh, no trophy. He stupidly, and as he admits, he stupidly threw the ditch and dumped it in the river because he didn't want some sticking mess sitting in the, in the car. As soon as we saw that, we just... Cameras are all at the wrong angle. You know, you had this thing hanging up, and he was standing way back from it. There. Cameras live. I brought that case to the media. He never brought the story to me. A mate of his saw the photos, I harassed the crap out of him, and finally he let me, let me break the story. He made nickels and dimes out of the whole thing. He, all he did was have a nervous breakdown from all the screwballs ringing him up. He didn't want any publicity at all. I, have, I pushed him into doing it. There's been no really concerted effort to obtain specimens and we do need specimens. It's not a matter of taking photographs. Today with digital photography it's quite possible to concoct anything you like. Until I could put a, until someone could put a body on the table, photos and video in the real world, you know, the real hard sciences, they don't mean anything. The animal that Kurt shot and other animals that I have photos of are feral cats from DNA. We had DNA done in one of the down in Victoria, which are bigger than mates of leopards. I'm very familiar with feral cats. I've shot literally hundreds. Um, and I'm yet to find a feral cat. I've never handled a feral cat that weighed more than seven kilograms. Um, and I've done a pretty exhaustive search of the literature and also dealt with a lot of other people who research feral cats. None of us have seen a healthy one that's actually been over probably 10 kilos. That's solid muscle we're talking about. Now an interesting thing about feral cats is when you see one, uh, even the very biggest ones, they're quite dinky. Its legs are thin. Its feet, when you extend the claws, are probably so big. Not all that massive. The animal I saw, it had, oh, here's my forearm, okay. Its legs, front legs, forelegs in particular, were thicker than mine. The muscles were moving under the skin. That doesn't happen with feral cats. Um, I don't need to be convinced. I know what I saw, but I'm not selling that to anybody else. <laughs> it's enough to keep me searching to get definitive evidence. Yeah. I believe it's all dogs. Dogs gone wild. We've had um, carcasses brought in. To the zoo for us to have a look at and 
from what we've seen um, of these carcasses, it's always been dog killings. It's not been a cat. Dogs and dingoes kill in a particular fashion. They tend to, when they pull an animal down, they're fairly messy about it. Uh, if it's a sheep, it looks like it's had a hand grenade shoved up it. Okay, it's just wool everywhere. Um, if you go to Western Victoria and southeastern South Australia, where there are virtually no wild dogs, believe me, wild dogs give themselves away. They vocalise, they leave very distinctive tracks. Um, they can be got if they're there by a, a professional dog trapper. A cat, when it typically kills, um, would go for the soft belly, open up and then eat from around there. Um, dogs, if it's one or two dogs, it's usually a like a frenzy where they've ripped it all apart. To see a sheep that's killed cleanly by a bite to the throat, then it's opened up and its, its chest is opened up, its heart, lungs and liver are removed in one hit, and then to still find it warm, you put your hand inside it, believe me, it's as warm as you are. Um, that makes you look over your shoulder occasionally when you, when you get onto a kill like that. Cats usually um, open up and eat from the inside, so they'll They'll eat the vital organs like the liver and the kidneys, which you know, are high in nutrient content, and then muscle meat. Um, but I've not seen anything to say that it's a cat. The official line is, oh, it must be feral pigs or it must be dogs. It's not. Um, if you ask anybody that's hunted dogs or pigs for many years, as I have, you, you just, you're not finding the sign of them. They, they, they give themselves away. Um, this is nothing like that at all. In view of the number of reports and the number of confrontations between people and the animals and with the amount of stock killing and also uh, the number of kangaroos and possibly other animals that are, that are being eaten, uh, they need to have, these, these creatures need to have a status where, so we can, we can uh, approach um, some decent um, uh, biological research without knowing what they are it's not possible to, um, to do any serious research. Look at the foxes that live in, in Melbourne. No one sees them except the late night revellers. <laughs> yeah, or early morning if you're doing the garbage or something like that or travelling to work at three o'clock in the morning. Precise there, look how well hidden they stay. Mm, yeah, interesting. Yeah, nice to talk with you, Simon. My pleasure. Thank, thank, you. Oh. thank you for your time. Good day. Simon Townsend is a naturalist from Freshwater Creek and a former zookeeper.